Anomalocaris has often been considered the apex predator of the Cambrian, which is when life first really started to boom and diversify into many different kinds of groups. There's been a lot of discussion as to whether or not different fossils that look very similar to Anomalocaris actually are Anomalocaris, such as in the Emu Bay Shale in Australia, and there will be more on that later from a second paper, but this first paper didn't actually look at any of the fossils from the Emu Bay Shale, the second one did. The first one was just trying to figure out how they hunted, and if they were really apex predators. What they found is, yeah, probably, but not of the things we normally show them hunting, namely trilobites. This paper made 3D models of the great appendages, the large graptorial grabbing arms at the front of Anomalocaris, and tried to quantify how they would have worked. In order to make sure that these 3D models and where essentially they pulled tight were accurate, they looked at different limbs from a lot of different animals, including things like whip scorpions. But what they found was probably the most likely comparison was a specialized limb that you find in pycnogonids, or sea spiders, this really, really strange group of things related to arachnids that live in the deep ocean. They're really interesting and really strange, and we should study them more, but for now, it's basically just going, hey, this limb is similar to what we find in Anomalocaris. So then they mapped out where the muscles would have been and looked at how it would have tightened its grip around prey. By adding not just the models, but also the muscles to the models, they were able to do FEA, or finite element analysis, where you have some element of an animal and there's only a finite, a limited amount of different potential options that it could have taken with that setup. And then you analyze that data. And what they found is it wouldn't have been able to actually grip so hard that it would have been able to puncture the shells of things like trilobites. Trilobites had very hard calcitic shells. It would have struggled to get through those. Instead, it was probably going after mostly softer prey and potentially not even actually interacting with the sea floor that much, which is interesting. The Cambrian is going to get this explosion of life in the sea floor. We suddenly have all kinds of worm burrows and mollusk burrows and other things burrowing through the mud but it seems like Anomalocaris, as the top predator, wasn't going after those. So it may have been hunting something different, potentially even other animals that were related to it in the radiodonts. In fact, based on their study, if Anomalocaris had actually tightened its grip around something that was hard, it would have actually faced a high risk of shattering some of the spines on the arms. And we know of exactly one Anomalocaris specimen with one damaged spine, so it's not like they were doing that super often. Now, there's still going to be some debate about this. I personally know someone who looked at a lot of trace fossils in the Bright Angel Shale in the Grand Canyon, and there's some fossils in there that are odd scrapes through the sand, and they don't really know what made them, but that researcher at least suggested, hey, maybe it's an Anomalocaris or something similar grabbing prey off the bottom. It'd be interesting if we actually had body fossils from the Bright Angel Shale, it just wasn't a great condition for body fossils, so hopefully we'll find something, but maybe not. Maybe there was an Anomalocarid specially evolved to handle more hard, tough prey. We just don't know that yet. But this study really does change our perspective on Anomalocaris. It's not a terror of the trilobites grabbing prey off the seafloor and carrying it away off into space and or just higher in the water column. Instead, it would have been in that water column hunting soft things that were also in it. That said, that's just for Anomalocaris canadensis, and I did already mention there's some other things, like some of the animals coming from the Emu Bay Shale, and there's been a lot of debate as to whether or not those are or aren't Anomalocaris. So this paper looked at the Emu Bay Shale to say, hey, are these Anomalocaris or are they something different? What they found is in some cases, yes, it is Anomalocaris, a different species of Anomalocaris, but in other cases, no, it's an entirely new animal. And they did this by essentially studying the arms and looking at the actual structures of the spines, and there's a few different types of those structures. The entirely new animal in a different genus has been named Echidnacaris brigzi, after the echidna, because it's from Australia, and the echidna's from Australia, so it makes sense, they're both spiny. However, their spines are still mostly similar to Anomalous Caris, at least as far as not being blunted and designed for crushing. Which is funny, it means they were probably not hunting trilobites also, but they have sometimes been preserved with trilobites in the same fossil slab. So if there were trilobites there, they just weren't being eaten by these. But as I mentioned, some of it isn't Echidnacaris, it is Anomalocaris, but a new species, Anomalocaris daliae. And you can see in this direct comparison the different orientations of the spines, different numbers of spines, etc. They're different animals. And while they were definitely related, they at least had some sort of niche partitioning. They weren't out competing one another directly, although I'm sure they did compete at some times. 
One of the more interesting parts of this paper is actually looking at where things related to Echidnocaris actually come from, because the continents at this time were basically North America all alone and all of the other ones smushed together at the bottom of the planet. So what it seems like happened is the anomalocarids could actually migrate between these continents at least to some degree, potentially because they were swimming in the open ocean more. And that's why we have anomalocarids up north in Canada, but also further south and in some places that were around this lower continental shelf. Meanwhile, everything related to Echidnocaris is just around that continental shelf. It was pretty much only around the south part of the planet. So they weren't interacting with the open ocean in the same way. And there's always a chance we could find something closely related to Echidnocaris not in Australia or not around that southern continent and in North America, but that's just not what we've done yet. So maybe there's a chance there could have been more different flow of different populations between those continents, but we just don't know yet. Right now it seems like at least some of them were pretty locked down just in the southern part of the planet. But all this taxonomy stuff is good because we can actually potentially at least start trying to figure out how the radiodonts like Anomalocaris and its relatives started to evolve and how they spread across the planet. Because the Cambrian is known for having an explosion, maybe having these different fossils from different places can start helping us narrow down the search for the next great Cambrian logger stock that has fossils like this. But it's going to take some time to actually find those fossils, get them out, and get them published. So, you know, if you're somewhere with Cambrian rocks, feel free to go looking.